Hi church, this is Pastor Lisa, and today's scripture comes from uh, Romans 13, 9 and 10, and it says, the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't desire what others have, and any other commandment that are all summed up in one word, you must love your neighbor as yourself. Love doesn't do anything wrong to its neighbor, therefore love is what fulfills the law. And the other one comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 37 through 39. And he replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You must love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At the 2012 General Conference, there was a resolution passed that there was indignities and atrocities and cultural genocide against many tribal people. And that God has been present with everyone since creation. Sorry, having phone issues this today. Uh, let me try it this way. Huh. Maybe. Okay, back to what I was saying. Um... God has been present with everyone since the beginning of creation. In many places, to become Christian meant to abandon your culture, your traditional religion, which causes tension in families and results in the loss of a unique identity. In some places, it means to no longer speak your language, wear traditional dress, change your hair as well, and participate in traditional dance and ceremonies. In 1992, as well as in the 2004, in 2008, two, sorry, 92, as well as 2004 and 2008, the Methodist Church recognizes the church's participation in the destruction of Native American people, culture and religious practices, and in 1996, adopted Resolution 135 to support restitution to the Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma for the Sand Creek Massacre. In 96, acknowledging the genocide of almost 200 persons mostly women and children who were at a U.S. peace camp in an attack led by Methodist pastor John Shivington. At the 2008 General Conference, there was an act of repentance and reconciliation that was done, and it was directed that all conferences of the United Methodist Church would do one. Our conference did it in 2015. The General Conference of the 2016 the report was made in offering apologies for the part the Methodist Church played in the Sand Creek Massacre to the descendants of Sand Creek. So I want to tell you about Sand Creek. John Milton Shivington was a former Methodist pastor who served as a colonel in the United States Volunteers during the Colorado War and New Mexico campaigns of the Civil War. Shivington earned his reputation for leading a 700-man force of Colorado militia during the massacre of Sand Creek in November 1864, where an estimated 200 peaceful Cheyenne and Arapaho, about two-thirds of which were women and children and infants, were killed and mutilated by troops. That's putting it mildly. Shivington and his men took scalps and other body parts as souvenirs. The Joint Committee on... <coughs> The war on um, the conduct of war investigated Shivington and those he commanded and their actions were strongly condemned, yet no criminal charges were brought, and the closest thing to a punishment Shivington suffered was the effective end to his political aspirations. Now, Shivington was born in Lebanon, Ohio, was ordained in 1844 in the Methodist Church. His first appointment was in the Illinois Conference, where he served 10 years, and he moved to Kansas where he worked as a missionary to the Wyandotte people as part of the Kansas-Nebraska Annual Conference. His outspoken views put him in danger. Upon the advice of friends, Shivington was persuaded to leave Kansas Territory for the Nebraska Territory. And as a result, the Methodist Church then transferred Shivington to Omaha. Historian James Haynes said that of Shivington's pastoral abilities, he was not as steady in his demeanor as a man of God called to the work of ministry giving his ministerial friends regret and even trouble in their efforts to sustain his reputation. In May 1860, Shivington moved to Denver in what was the Colorado Territory, 
for his goals was to establish missions in the mining camps. He was elected presiding elder of the new Rocky Mountain District. Controversy would begin to damage Shivington's appointment, who stopped performing his duties as a presiding elder, and he was not reappointed. At the 1862 conference, rather than, rather his name was recorded as located. Now, if you are located, it means you're not going to receive an appointment and that what you've been doing isn't necessarily in accordance with our book of discipline. According to early Methodist polity, describing a minister as located meaning he has effectively been retired. Historian method of Methodism, Isaac Beardsley, a personal friend of Shivington, suggested Shivington was thrown out because of his involvement with the armed forces, an association that would lead to Shivington's downfall. His status was being located, did not remove him completely from Methodist politics, and his name appears as a member of the executive board of Colorado Seminary and on the incorporation documents issued by the Council and House of Representatives, Representatives of the Colorado Territory. When the Civil War broke out, Colorado Territorial Governor offered him a commission as a chaplain, but he refused it, saying he wanted to fight, and he was commissioned as a major. In 1862, Shivington was appointed Colonel of the 1st Colorado Volunteer Regiment of Cavalry. The darker side of Shivington revealed that in complaints of captured Confederate chaplain, who wrote that Shivington had threatened to kill prisoners he captured in his battles. And in November 1862, he was appointed Brigadier General of Volunteers, but the appointment was withdrawn three months later. Damn any man who sympathizes with, when, with Indians. I have come to kill Indians, and I believe it is right and honorable to use any means under God's heaven to kill Indians, kill and scalp them all, big and little. Nits make lies. This is a direct quote from Colonel John Milton Shivington. A delegation of Cheyenne Kiowa and Arapaho chiefs in Denver, Colorado on September 28, 1864. In the fall of 1864, several things happened. Major Edward Weinkoop received a letter from the delegation of the Cheyenne Kiowa and Arapaho chiefs requesting a peace council and an exchange of prisoners. Weinkoop secured the release of some prisoners who had been taken during earlier raids. And Weinkoop and Silas, Captain Silas Suley, after the peace conference, he went to Denver with returned prisoners and, and some of the chiefs and was able to convince the reluctant territorial governor to be with the chiefs. It resulted in an offer of protection to those Indians who would surrender. The chiefs agreed, and after gathering the tribe, they set up camp about 40 miles north of, South, of Fort Lyon at Big Sandy Creek. Around that same time, Governor Evans received permission to found the 3rd Colorado Cavalry, which would be made up of volunteers who would sign on for 100 days. The purpose of the regiment was to protect Denver and the Platte Road and was assigned to the District of Colorado, commanded by Shimington. For political reasons, Evans had stirred up fears of the people about the possibility of Indian attacks and he and Shivington had hoped military confrontations against the Indians would help their career. But most of the Indian war parties and attacks were happening hundreds of miles away. In October 1864, the Hundred Day War, or sorry, the Hundred Day Enlistment of the Volunteers was coming to an end, and Shivington's Civil War enlistment had expired, meaning he would soon lose his command. And after he found out about the agreement with the chiefs, he complained that Major Winecoop was too peaceable to the Indians, and Winecoop was replaced with Major Anthony, who agreed with the goal of killing off all the Indians. After resettling his people and hearing the promised supplies were ending, one of the chiefs sent out most of the warriors to hunt, leaving only 60 men in the village, most of them who were too old or too young to hunt. In November, setting out from Fort Lyon, Colonel Shivington and his 700 troops marched just outside the reservation, and they set up camp on November 28, 1864, and there was heavy drinking within the camp as they celebrated their victory, and the next morning, Shivington ordered his troops to attack. Captain Sully thought the Indians were peaceful and refused to follow Shivington's order and told his men to hold fire. Other soldiers attacked the village, ignoring the U.S. flag given to them and the white flag as soon as the soldiers started firing. Shivington's soldiers massacred the majority of the unarmed Cheyenne, and the attack became known as the Sand Creek Massacre. Shivington lost between 15 
lost 15 soldiers and 50 were wounded, mostly due to friendly fire, probably because they were drinking all night the night before. And between 150 and 200 Indians were estimated dead. Most were women and children. And when he was called to testify before Congress, he said that they killed 500 to 600, with very few being women. There were others who testified against him. Shivington declared victory against what he said were hostile Cheyenne. However, the testimony of Sule and his men resulted in a congressional investigation where it was determined that Shivington had acted wrongly. Sule and some of the men whom he had commanded testified against Shivington at his court-martial. Shivington called Sule a liar, and Sule was later murdered by a soldier who had been under Shivington's command at St. Creek. Some believe Shivington might have been involved. He was condemned for his part in the massacre, but either he resigned, and the general amnesty that was given to Civil War soldiers meant that the criminal charges could not be filed against him. An army judge publicly stated that Sand Creek Massacre was a cowardly and cold-blooded slaughter. Public outrage was intense. It was believed to have contributed to public pressure to change Indian policy, and Congress later rejected the idea of a general war against Indians in the West. The panel on Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War declared, as the Colonel Shivington, your committee, can hardly find fitting terms to describe his conduct. Wearing the uniform of the United States should be an emblem of justice and humanity, holding the important position of commander of a military district, and therefore having the honor of the government to that extent in his keeping. He deliberately planned and executed a foul and dastardly massacre, having full knowledge of their... <sighs> Sorry having full knowledge of their friendly character and having himself been instrumental to some extent in placing them in the position of fancy security. He took advantage of their defenselessness, their co defenseless condition to gratify the worst passion that ever cursed the heart of man. Whatever influence this may have had upon Colonel Shivington, the truth is, is that he surprised and murdered in cold blood the unsuspecting men, women, and children of Sand Creek who had every reason to believe they were under the protection of the of the United States authorities. Because he was in a position as a lay preacher, the 1996 General Conference expressed regret for the Sand Creek Massacre, issued apology to the Southern Cheyenne for the actions of a prominent Methodist. And as I learned the history of just this one incident and learned that this man was called to be a Methodist pastor, I struggle with what part of what we now see is the three simple rules from John Wesley, do no harm, do good, stay in love with God. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, let's take them apart. Do no harm. Is anybody ever truly successful in doing no harm? Most of us would say yes. I do pretty good at not doing any harm. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't caused anybody problems. <clears throat> so I'm doing a pretty good on the first rule. We have to ask ourselves, have we gotten angry over the past couple of days? Well, that's harm to ourselves. So then we're not good at keeping that first rule. Second rule, do good. Well, I, we believe because we aren't bad people, so that must mean that we are good. Not necessarily. The disciples came up to Jesus and said, good teacher. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one except for the Father is good. So if Jesus himself isn't a good person, then we've really missed the mark. And the third, stay in love with God. Do we really need to discuss this one? Well, we don't read the word of God like we should. We don't pray like we should. We don't live our lives in the most holiest way like we should. John Wesley was a man after God's own heart. <coughs> he was faithful to the rules. So why do we fall short? There are those of us who stumble and may get lost. And we come back right to, back to the path that he has us on. And then there are those who get so lost. They do terrible things that hurt others. John Shivington lost the good and the do no harm because of this. And the aspirations he had were lost. Amen.